I'd like to get just a quick mention to DPI for their support for today and providing through their key researchers. It's been great to, um, to have them along today. Um, but it's also good that we've had some support from Nigel Kieran's and um, Tasmania Institute of Ag and CSIRO. So it's always good to spread the, spread the, um, the speaker list across different organisations. Um, so Gordon's going to be talking about grazing wheat forage, companion plants to substitute or complement mineral supplementation. So Gordon is a research scientist with the DPI. He's a ruminant reproduction researcher with studies covering fields of genetics, meat science, nutrition, heat stress and wool production. His current studies include managing triplet ewes, mineral balance in sheep grazing perennial wheat, improving the adoption of pregnancy scanning, assessing climate vulnerability of sheep and cattle, and refining sheep body condition score targets. So I'll uh, hand over to Gordon to um, take us for the next half hour. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I probably should have updated that bio. I'm not doing the triplets work anymore, it's finished. Uh, but good news is we're developing a body condition scoring device, which has been going really nicely. Uh, it's a different clicker, so hopefully I'll sail through nicely without any magical slide change. Uh, and also I'd just like to say that it's a real honour for me to give a presentation here uh, because my old professor Ted Wolfe is in the room uh, and I've got so much respect for Ted, it's a great chance for me to give a talk uh, for him to see how I've grown in whatever many years it is. Thanks, Martin and, uh, and Jeff, for the invitation, and uh, welcome back after lunch. If you fall asleep, <coughs> uh, I'll be asking you questions. Okay, so the idea here is that grazing cereals can be a really risky but really profitable forage. Uh, and so as a reproduction researcher, I come to this thinking about how can we maintain and protect the health of the animals that are on the forages, in particular twin-bearing ewes, because that's the animal class that has the highest requirement for these minerals that can be challenged in these forage types. So animal health in the pursuit of production is what we're really looking for here. Uh, I don't need to introduce dual purpose cereal crops to you. Everybody's familiar with the productivity gain. Of course, a rehash is that they fill the winter feed gap. Uh, when compared to pastures, the animals will grow. Uh, they'll put on live weight uh, and body condition and they give the option to grain uh, and graze at the same time. There's small downside risks depending on your environment, okay? So uh, if you're further, if, as you get closer to the range lens, time of sowing is really important because uh, you don't get so, much, so many days of the year to graze the crop before you've got to lock it up to recover the grain. And there's always the risk of a late overgraze, so you can reduce yield if you just keep pushing closer into, further into August. And then there's the principal downside risk is the impact on animal health. So that's the primary focus of this presentation. A, a rehash of that is, everybody's familiar with the solution, which I'll get to, but the primary problem is that uh, wheats in particular, wheats and triticales, but to a lesser extent barley and oats, uh, have excess amounts of potassium. And they also have insufficient amounts of sodium. And the problem there is that has an impact on magnesium and calcium absorption. And while those two nutrients are adequate or near marginal in the forage, it's when we get this relationship between high potassium to low sodium, or just on its own, high potassium, you get a reduction in the absorption, in particular of magnesium, in the rumen. Now, calcium can be absorbed elsewhere through the digestive tract, but there's also evidence that shows that calcium can be impaired in its absorption uh, in the rumen when you have these conditions of high potassium and low sodium, which is the characteristic of wheat there's also uh, what we call the high DCAD. The DCAD is the dietary cation anion difference. It talks about how much potassium and sodium you've got in the, in the forage as opposed to sulphur and chloride. The implications there are around pH. Sulphur and chloride become hydrogen sulphide or hydrogen chloride, which changes pH pretty quickly. So you've got some issues around K and A, which are really serious, and some theoretical issues around high DCAD. The, Extension of high DCAD moves into vitamin D3 production in the kidney. So when the pH changes uh, really goes up, you don't have too much sulfur and chloride, so the pH is going up, uh, you get an impairment of the hydroxylation of vitamin D3 in the kidney, 
which affects the ability of that hormone to become a really, or that vitamin to become a really bioactive hormone. That extends to problems in animal health. The, it, the risks we all are very familiar with is uh, milk fever or hypocalcemia and hypermagnesemia, so uh, grass tetany. You'll see these in sheep and cattle in particular, uh, and twin bearing and triplet ewes uh, most commonly. For sheep, it's a disease that happens before lambing and in peak lactation, and where for cattle, it's a much more of an issue in lactation. You can also get issues around subclinical acidosis, which is actually probably much more serious than we really give it credit to, and you can have problems with photosensitivity at times. They tend to be transient. Subclinical ruminal acidosis is going to be a problem with introduction. Photosensitivity happens on its own randomly to some animals. Uh, but there might also still be risks for bone health around diseases like osteoporosis or rickets, which is problems with vitamin D3, problems with um, a, a skewed calcium phosphorus ratio, or you might just not have enough calcium. So if the animals are on a long graze period, a very long period of time, with inadequate mineral supplementation, they'll be drawing calcium out of their bones. And that can lead to rickets. So the solution, it's pretty simple, we've known about this solution for about 20 years, which is a loose lick of Cosmag lime and salt. So some sort of source of magnesium, which comes in Cosmag. Uh, you can also use uh, dolomite, which is dolomites used to create Cosmag, so 50, well, and it's not as absorbable, but Cosmag is a good solution, lime uh, and salt. In a ratio of two to two to one by volume, so if you were to do it by buckets, you'd have two buckets of Cosmag, two buckets of lime, one bucket of salt, or if you did it by weight, one to one to one. The animals will need anywhere between uh, 10 to 30 grams per head per day. So the rule is provide those licks, keep them ad lib. And therein lie some of the other problems. The salt's hygroscopic, it wants to absorb moisture, and so when it starts to do that, your licks will start to pan out a little bit and become slurries. They might dry out a little bit and become harder to eat. And so our ad libitum intake can be impaired because of the nature of uh, the moisture absorbing characteristics of the loose lick. And then of course you start to get variation in intake. But you also have variation in intake anyway. Uh, this, is, this comes out of a little piece of work we did last year where we had animals in six different plots uh, and we provided them with ad libitum intake and we measured how much was eaten on a weekly basis uh, and so what you see generally is a trend to not eating so much of the lick towards the end of the trial period. The grazing period here is a 12-week study, so each number on the bottom there represents a week, and that's the average amount of intake per animal per day. So, and we wanted them to eat around about 30 grams, and so one plot did it once, the rest of them poking in here at about 10 or 12. But there's enormous amounts of variation. Some plots just wouldn't eat any in some weeks. So there's variation, and this is a life-saving supplement. That's a problem. So we had a conversation around the tea room in, I think it was 2015 or 16, might have been 2016. I've been working in grazing cereals for a few years, and we were talking about the results of a study where we were comparing the responses of animals in their plasma, right, so that's in their bloodstream, and in their urine, and what the urine tells us is what the kidneys are, are prepared to let go. So if you can measure it in urine, then the kidneys are saying, yeah, I've got enough, I can let it go. In Western Australia, they were having minimal problems with the excretion of sodium and magnesium in urine, but in New South Wales, the sheep weren't letting it go. And we looked into this a little further, and while, yes, there's some different uh, soil potassium and soil sodium concentrations in their soils compared to here, some of the other characteristics of, the, of those other sites were that they had competing plants in with the wheat crops, in particular cape weed. Now we're not going to do a study on cape weed, I don't think, I can't see that getting a wide ranging adoption. But the point is, there's an alternate forage in there that gave us a result that we weren't expecting. So our conversation then led to straight away, what if instead of having a forage uh, that required a mineral supplement in the paddock, always available for these animals, and you didn't want to have variation in intake, and didn't want to go out there and have to top it up all the time, what if we could just have a companion plant? So that started this conversation. So we did a study in 2019, this is just a summary of it, 
We had lambs that were pen fed. We used lambs because we wanted to take this through to uh, meat and we were examining the impacts of perennial wheat as well as annual wheat on animal growth, animal palatability, and maybe any other consequences that might have happened for, um, for meat. But we also did our blood and our urine testing on these animals through the study. They were held in individual pens, they were fed daily, uh, and the combinations were wheat or perennial wheat with or without lucerne. Now we chose lucerne because it grows upright and we're sickle bar mowing this stuff and packing it in tubs and feeding it to the sheep. And if we were to use an alternate legume that we sowed, it might not be in the harvest height. And we ran the study in 2019, which was a pretty difficult year to get anything to grow in the first instance. So this is, uh, this is the excretion of sodium and calcium over here, and then at the bottom, magnesium. And at the baseline, this is the samples that we collected from the animals when they went into the study, and then over the three weeks of blood sampling and urine sampling. And what this is telling us is that sodium disappears very small amounts, like this is a ratio of, it's a ratio, it tells us how much sodium is being excreted relative to the amount of creatinine. Creatinine is excreted as a constant, so we can use this to judge volumetric differences in sodium coming out in the urine. And it tells us very little sodium is coming out. In calcium, we're not getting any uh, differences between our diets, by the way, for sodium or for calcium. Calcium's going up, which is not what we expected. And magnesium, which is really interesting, magnesium declined really quite significantly. Very small amounts, 0 0.01, very small unit ratio of magnesium being excreted. But interestingly, some of these treatment effects uh, present and they are when we add lucerne. So if, now lucerne has more salt than perennial wheat and wedgetail wheat but it's still deficient in salt. But it's got plenty of calcium and it's got adequate magnesium. So it sort of gets halfway to solving these problems in our thinking. But because it grows upright it's pretty handy for an experiment when we're sickle bar mowing this stuff and feeding it to sheep in individual tubs. So we have a solution here. What it tells us firstly in, in data not presented is that uh, we had an increase in intake when we added lucerne to the diet. So we added a legume and they ate more. And in a couple of weeks, we sort of improved the mineral status of magnesium. But over the whole study, they continued to secrete less magnesium in their urine. We see very similar results in the plasma and that's where it really counts. Uh, a, a significant reduction in sodium in plasma uh, increases in calcium in plasma, again, not really expected, but no treatment effects in either of those. And in magnesium, just the same as the urine, we've got animals in the, in the first week of the study where they've got higher blood magnesium levels, but they decline over the study. So we haven't solved a problem, but we've got a little closer to a clue. So we thought, okay, right, maybe we can solve the problem now just by adding salt on its own. So we, we've replicated the study, we've done it again, uh, and we were feeding twin bearing ewes in this second study and that's because a twin, so firstly we gained a little more confidence that we weren't going to kill sheep in a pen study. That really helps your animal care and ethics status as a researcher. Uh, but also it was a, a riskier animal but it, it's more demanding for these nutrients so it'll probably tease out our effects even greater. That's the theory. We fed them this amount of forage. Uh, so that's how much we were feeding them on a daily basis in perennial wheat and some of them got salt, and that's how much salt they were getting, about 11 grams of salt. We were feeding them lucerne again and perennial wheat, and they were fed in separate tubs. The next photograph shows that. Uh, so these are twin bearing ewes. Uh, we had 48 animals, there's 12 in each diet, uh, and they were fed individually and separate feed types. So lucerne in one tub, perennial wheat in another tub. And that gave us a bit of an insight about preference, but we could also then judge how much nutritional intake these animals have had because we've separated the feed base. So just for colour, um, I use R, which is data visualisation and uh, statistical software, and you use ggplot, which is a package to create your plots, and all these plots come out in these colours. And coincidentally, they're the election colours. So. Uh, Labor wins the election on perennial wheat, apparently. So all the red is going to be perennial wheat in the next plots. Uh, the green will be perennial wheat plus lucerne. The teal independents are going to be perennial wheat plus salt. Uh, and the, uh, well they're supposed to be blue but they're a little bit embarrassed now and so it's a bit purple. 
uh, perennial wheat plus loose and plus salt. So we've got a diet now, perennial wheat, we've abandoned the annual wheat, perennial wheat, add loosen, add salt, add salt and loosen. What do we expect to see? So these ewes were fed for three weeks in late pregnancy and then were moved out of the pens onto their lambing paddocks. Firstly, as with the previous study, by adding a legume, we increased feed intake. So reds, perennial wheat, uh, green uh, and the purple have loosened in them and they have significant increases in feed intake. When we added the salt, we also got about a five-ish percent increase in salt uh, intake with salt. Uh, and likewise, adding salt to loosen, we get another little lift. So adding salt, adding legumes increases intake on a cereal diet. What goes with increases in intake is you get increases in live weight gain, and so there were some small subtle differences in live weight gain, particularly in the perennial wheat plus uh, loosen plus salt and in the plus salt diets. We had significant increases uh, and the perennial wheat only girls grew a little slowly. So these are box plots and that line in the middle there is the median line, it's not the average, but it'll be fairly close to average in normally distributed data, so it's about average, right? So the key thing is what happened in blood and what happened in urine. So in the blood is the most interesting or most important one. It's all very interesting. Uh, no, but we're going to go straight to urine first. So the experiment worked. And this is really actually quite important, very uh, comforting for a researcher to feed animals salt. So the way we did it was just to sprinkle the salt on the forage and mix it through the forage. Because the alternative was, how am I going to know how much salt these animals ate? If I put 10 grams or 11 grams of salt in a tub, and wait a week or a day on a measure on a daily basis and see how much they've eaten, I have problems with rainfall, I have problems with the animals knocking it out. So we just mix it into the forage. We can account for how much they've eaten, so we can account for approximately how much salt they ate. We don't know if they chase the salt, but the urine might tell us a bit. And so what this is showing us is that after one week, so we, blood, we took blood and urine from these animals on a weekly basis, anything given salt starts, starts to excrete a large amount of salt. That's a good outcome. Uh, secreting less over time. If we gave them lucerne, we start, and because lucerne's got more salt in it, they still had a slightly higher and it was statistically significant uh, ex increased excretion of salt. Okay, so we're getting more salt coming out of the animals. That's, that's a good outcome. Tells us the experiment's working. For calcium, the excretion of uh, calcium in urine is really interesting as well. If we give them lucerne, so lucerne of course is the green and the purple, we increase the excretion of calcium. The main pathway for calcium excretion is through faeces, not really in urine terribly much, but we're getting these effects in here, which is, in, which is encouraging. Uh, but what's interesting here is if we just add salt, which is theoretically supposed to allow the animal to absorb more calcium and magnesium, right? If it absorbs it, it's happy to let more of it go. But the performance is very similar to an animal that's not fed salt in a salt deficient diet. Didn't expect that. If we look at magnesium in urine, we see the same sorts of things that we saw in the lamb study, which is feeding loosen. Uh, we're going to increase the amount of uh, magnesium that the animal's prepared to excrete. But just the same as in the previous study, we see a decline in magnesium excretion. So we still have a problem. And adding salt doesn't really help that either. So in plasma, Calcium plasma, generally, uh, we have an increase in plasma in calci uh, calcium in plasma when we feed these animals loosen, but if we feed them just salt on its own, we start to get a reduction. That's totally in the opposite direction for what we were expecting. If anything, I would have expected no difference between the red and, uh, and the teal, but we got a reduction. Unexpected, I haven't found any literature that can explain that, so there's more for us to look into here, but there's, a, there's something to think about. Magnesium, basically, nothing too much to worry about. Problematic levels in magnesium, uh, particularly around seven, so we're not really going below 10. We see a reduction uh, in the first week and the animal's sort of adjusting a little bit to it and there's some playing around a little bit, but they're not falling over in plasma like they were in the lamb study. So the ewes are behaving differently. So take home messages, I've got just a couple of more slides. My take home messages are pretty clear. Legumes will increase intake by a reasonable amount, 25 or 30%. If we add salt to that, 
or not add legumes and just add salt, we'll get about a five or so percent increase in intake as well. Annual and perennial wheats are high in potassium and low in sodium, and so that's a real risk, risk for us. And while lucerne is great for calcium and okay for magnesium, and they provide some benefits, they haven't really solved the problem for us necessarily. Adding salt only doesn't appear to solve any of the problems for calcium and magnesium. And a forage mix of wheat and lucerne still needs cause mag and salt. So if we have, uh, so if you have a declining stand of lucerne and you sow wheat into it, you still need to provide cause mag and salt. Pretty straight home take home message, but you don't need to worry about lime. So this has led us to the next things to think about. What if we choose a different legume? What about if we choose a legume that's high in salt and high in magnesium? So the work that Richard Hayes has been doing uh, on legumes, it's a part of the LPP. Uh, we have this table here, which is uh, a potassium, sodium, magnesium ratio, and it tells us about the safety of a feed type. And we have a red line here. Anything above the line becomes a risk type of feed. And so Lucent's right on that line but we have French Cerradella uh, and uh, Lyra subclover well below. So our further, our further research is to examine these types of legumes as an alternate companion rather than loosen, and the idea is to get away from having any licks provided to these animals. So you don't have to worry about variation in intake, the animals just eat, it's in the paddock right there. Uh, and of course our study will lengthen our grazing periods because our first pen study uh, was only four weeks in duration. So this one will take out to 12 weeks. And that is the end of my slide. That's the end of my presentation. The cast of thousands, these are most of these people from New South Wales DPI involved in this study. It's been going for three years in different stages uh, and we've had engagement with Charles State University as well. So I'd like to thank all those uh, collaborators. Thanks, Jeff. Love speakers who stay on time. It's great. <laughs> um, so, as we did this morning, we will do a Q&A session at the end of the day at, at three o'clock, so um, keep your questions for then. Um, our next speaker is Rowan Smith. Uh, from